Because we share. Because we share. So before I get started, uh, on the couple of on the material outside and before and stuff, all the material says I'm from Visa Inc. And that was true up until a couple of weeks ago. And I left Visa and I've joined another company. Um, and with that in mind, I wanted to say this, that, that I'm not here on behalf of or representing my current employer because I didn't have time to run it through all the approvals and stuff. If you want to know who I work with, you can come talk to me afterwards. I'm just not going to announce it up here. Um, so I did work with Visa and now I work for another large financial institution. Now, my story starts a really long time ago. It starts in the 90s. <laughs> so for most of you, that's not that long ago. But you have to understand, for me, that's when I was a snotty teenager. And my dad had bought me one of these. Some of you may recognize it, some of you may not. This is a 14.4 modem. It was the first modem I got. Actually, it was the second modem I got. I had a 1200 baud modem for an Amiga. And then lightning hit the house, and it destroyed it before I had a chance to go online. So years later, when I saved up the money for my own computer, my dad bought me this. And I got exposed to the wonderful world of BBSs. So this is where I learned everything. Now, BBS, this is exactly what it looks like. Nice art and stuff like that. And you can see there's downloading files and file directories and mail. And what was best for me was the text files. And these were text files that explained how to do things like how to get free phone calls, how to tap into your neighbor's phone, how to steal credit card data, how to create fake credit cards, and so you can, how to do carding specifically, how credit cards work, all kinds of cool stuff. And one of my favorite one, when I was first starting out, there was a, there was a text from some person in Chicago, and it was about hacking McDonald's. And it was, and it's, and it was legitimate. So what this kid did is he worked for McDonald's, he had a job at McDonald's, and he learned that every night the manager would go and input all the information into the computer, it would dial up a modem, connect to some mainframe somewhere, and he would type in what he was doing. And every transaction he typed was printed on a dot matrix printer, and the manager would just throw those out. So he would dumpster dive in probably the greasiest dumpster and find all these printouts that had username and passwords into the, and the phone number into the system. So he goes into the system, and he gets his friend a job at McDonald's and writes a guide on how he did it and how to break in the numbers and everything like that. And, it did, and I read that, and that was probably one of the more formative texts that I read when I was younger. And I was giving a talk in Chicago, and I gave the same story, and a gentleman comes up to me and he goes, I was part of the incident response team for that breach. That kid was arrested, and the other kid was fined and put on parole because it was hacking. Now, at the time, the, the, the laws weren't as strict, but he still did hacking and stole money from McDonald's. But I was just like, wow, this guy's a hero. It's like, you know, you read something when you're young, you never think you're going to meet someone who actually had anything to do with it. Now, one of the things that I got exposed to was Datapack. Datapack was an X25 network that ran across Canada. I learned this through text files. This is an example of a text file about Datapack and explains everything that's going on, explains how to connect to nodes, and explains how you can connect to other nodes like Telenet, TimeNet, SprintNet. I used that information to start exploring the web. Long distance in Canada is ridiculous. It's super expensive. I didn't have the money as a teenager to go calling places overseas or in the US. Actually, not even out of town. It was so expensive. But I could use this to connect to other systems and probably mainframes that I couldn't access otherwise. So at the time, this is who I thought I was. <laughs> right? This is, this is the scene from War Games. This is uh, him hacking Whopper, which is a mainframe that is used to control the thermonuclear arsenal. And that's why I was pretending I was being. So fast forward about 10 years, I join a consulting firm. And I come with a lot of experience in Linux and Unix and Unix security, Unix security configuration, and all that stuff. And so I come across, and I join the firm. And I'm like, yes, they're going to put me on these awesome audits. I'm going to have a lot of work to do. It's going to be great. And they put me on mainframe work. They just put me straight into the mainframe space. And I thought, well, that's great for me because I always loved the mainframe. I was always interested in it. I was always fascinated by it. Terrible idea for them because I had no experience. So they send me out with these checklists, and you're off to go do checklist audit. And here I am, some 20-year-old. And I'm telling probably some of you people here how to run your systems, having never touched them or seen them before. I would bounced around consulting firms for a bit. And then uh, in 2009, late 2009, more like 2010, I joined Visa. And I joined Visa in their internal audit department because I had background with large financial systems and because I had 
experience doing mainframe audits. And then I worked there for a couple of years, and then I joined the, internal, the information security team at Visa, and then I left and joined my current employer in their cybersecurity red team. And a red team is sort of like a secret penetration testing team. Currently, if you're gonna get a test done, you go and you ask someone and you say, hey, come do a test. A, a red team is, we just show up and you don't even know we're there. The point is to not know we're coming. So while I was at Visa, that's sort of when the passion for the mainframe really kicked off for me. I started doing my own personal research. Someone pointed me in the direction of ZPDT, which is what it was called at the time. They've changed names a whole bunch of times. And, and I thought to myself, you know, I've learned a lot. I can't be the only one who has my background in information security and interesting in hacking and all that stuff. I can't be the only one who's thinking like this. I can't be the only person who would be interested. Maybe someone else would like to hear this. And so I started speaking at conferences. And I started giving various talks. So I gave my first talk was at, let's see here, is this gonna, there we go. So I gave my first talk at B-Sides Las Vegas. Small talk, 30 people, that's it. There's 30 people in the room. Then I gave another talk at ShmooCon, which is a IT security professional conference in, in Washington, D.C. And it was a room about twice this size. And there were still only about 30 people in the room. <laughs> and then I gave a talk in Chicago and another talk at B-Sides. This one was specifically about the breach that happened in Sweden, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Then I gave a talk at Black Hat in Las Vegas, which was a room about this size and about the same number of people. And then I gave a talk at DEF CON, which was a room about double the size and there was standing room only. So there is interest. Anyone, has anyone seen my talk? A show of hands if you've seen some of my talks. Okay, so this is, that's about what I expected. When I, I, it could go either way when I was rehearsing. I thought it might go not a lot of people or way too many people, and then you don't need to be here. On top of doing the talks, I, I do another thing that I like to call the Internet Mainframe Project. And what that does is, is I started sort of searching for mainframes on the Internet. And, and I actually, so funny story is I use a tool called MassScan. MassScan uses all your bandwidth to scan the entire internet. And I ran it at home and I went to bed and I woke up and Comcast had turned off my internet. <laughs> and I got an email on my phone that said, you have a virus, your internet's off till noon. Fix your, fix your computer. And so I didn't do anything, I just didn't run the program again and I have never had a problem since. And so I reached out to some people who have the resources to scan the entire internet and they're interested in the work I'm doing, and I said, hey, can you scan port 23, 1023, 23023, 992, and 9992, or four nines and a two? And they said, sure, and they went off, and then I got thousands of IP addresses and thousands of open ports, and I rescanned them with a tool called Nmap that I had patched to support identifying mainframes, and we found, I found 332 3270 sessions. Now there are FTPs and all that kind of stuff, but this is what I cared about. I just wanted to get those screens. And then I wrote a tool that goes and logs in and grabs screenshots like this of internet facing mainframes. Now this one is, is one of my favorites, but not my favorite. This is the one that sort of gave me pause and I couldn't sleep at night because if you can see that down there, this is a military mainframe that is internet facing. Now when I saw this for the first time, Actually, I'm getting chills now as I'm talking about it in front of this big room. I couldn't sleep. I spent the night tossing and turning every time a, a police car, an ambulance, a fire truck drove by. I thought, that's it, they're coming for me, that's it. This is the end of it. Sure enough, nothing happened. I mean, it's just, it's no different than going to a military website. It's just information that's free and out there. I didn't do anything wrong. And in fact, this screenshot was taken in April of last year. So, and I actually don't think it's online anymore. So here's another interesting one. You guys might recognize the brand. It's a car company. Uh, another interesting one, this is, if you can't read that, that's the Court Information System of Raleigh, North Carolina. Some of you who manage these systems may be in the room today. <laughs> I'm hoping. This is my favorite, though. This is my favorite. If you look in the very top left, can you see who this belongs to? Yeah, so, and they just updated. Before, it used to be a blank screen and just said Egypt Air on the top. And now they added this, congratulations, the migration is complete and you can see all the systems that run on this mainframe, which is kind of neat, right? So when I saw this, I was like, this is amazing. Cargo, fuel management system? My dad was an airline pilot, a commercial airline pilot for years, so I'm fascinated. I, just found, I was like, this is, 
this is perfect. This is like a dream come true. I've, I've also found other kind of interesting things. For example, of the mainframes that I've found online, so of the 332, only about half are using SSL. And of the half that are using SSL, only about a third have valid SSL certificates. The others are using self-signed certificates, so some people are chuckling because they know what that means. The SSL certs are invalid. They're either self-signed or they've expired. And some of you are saying, and who cares? This is a tool that does a man-in-the-middle attack and will steal credentials. So here you're going to see an example of someone stealing FTP credentials from someone logging into a mainframe. Now, I also patched this tool to support stealing TSO credentials. So here you see the username and the password. And for those of you who are going to be reading my slides later in PDF, here's a screenshot of that tool in action. So now, those 50% that are unprotected, you can steal credentials. So that's great. Now it's like you can drop a pin in the room now. So now, so this section is going to be a little rough to get through, but this is from a air quote hacker perspective, what I see the current landscape is. Now I've been in the IT security side for about 10 plus years. I've grown up in it. I've seen where it's coming from. Right now, there's really two kind of testing that you get. You get penetration testing and you get vulnerability scanning. Now vulnerability scan, really easy. You go, you take a list of open known vulnerabilities to a platform, you run a scan against the system, you take the open ports, and the open ports will come back and say, hey, I'm Apache version 1.6. And then the vulnerability scanner will go in its database, and it'll say, OK, version 1.6, ah, that's vulnerable to this kind of attack. You need to be version 1.6.1. Raise an alert. That's all a vulnerability scanner does. Now, what a penetration tester does is they take those, those reports, and then they say, oh, it's vulnerable to this kind of attack. Let me see if that attack actually works on this platform. Let me take that report, let me take those vulnerabilities that we know about and test them. What they also go above and beyond is, is if it's in the scope, they might start stealing data. Whoa. They might start doing all kinds of cool stuff on the environment to show that they could get into it and what damage they could cause. So if they can access core system resources, if they can shut things off, they're going to demonstrate that because it raises the risk of the report that they're writing. And so, in this environment for penetration testing, there's really two kinds of tests that you can have. You can have a white box test, which is you're meeting with the developers, you get all the information, you've read all the guides, everything's available freely to you, and you get a black box test, which the scope is, here's an IP address, come back in a couple of months. You can do whatever you want. You can, if you can find guides on this, go for it. We're not going to share information. Now, currently, as I've seen at many places, there's not really much mainframe penetration testing going on. Uh, in many places that I've been, I haven't seen it. Now, I know it's going on in some places. I know some people here do that. Uh, I know IBM has services that they provide. But it's not, you know, if, if I told you today that I had a Windows system implementation and we weren't doing any security testing on that environment, I'd get laughed off the stage. But right now, it's a scattershot in terms of what testing is being done on the mainframe. And some of the reasons I've tried to outline here, this is just personal opinion, but some of the reasons for me, there's a lack of skill set. I am the only person at conferences talking. I'm the only one at those. I have looked. Historically, at DEF CON, there has been two talks about mainframe security, mine and one other guy who was talking about retro hacking. So he was talking about like Vax VMS systems. There's not really much appetite from the enterprise to do this kind of testing. Enterprise is much, there's much bigger fish to fry. They have Windows and Linux to worry about. They got malware on desktops to worry about. They got mobile coming up that they got to worry about. We know the mainframe is secure. We don't need to worry about it. So there's not much appetite there. And then you have the political power that you guys ha hold within the, within the corporation. You guys have a lot of political power. And, and so this is an example of a story. I went and I said, hey, I want to do a port scan of the core mainframe systems. I want to check all the open ports and see what's running on them. And the chief operating officer said, that's a great idea. Go ahead. If there's a system outage, you're fired. And I thought, OK, I'm not going to do that, because <laughs> I'm not stupid. And I know full well, 
even if I didn't cause the outage, I was going to get fired no matter what. So I'm not going to do that. And it's that problem. And the other challenge, and that's the last bullet, is the availability. People are more concerned about their system availability than they are about having it tested. And in the, the Windows and Linux world where I come from, you just assume it's getting tested all the time. If you put a machine on the, on the internet, it's just getting hit nonstop. That's, it's just background noise on the, main, on the internet, just constant port scans, malware trying to get in, and it's just nonstop. Now, on the other side of the fence, you have vulnerability scanning. So for vulnerability scanning, you guys are probably getting forced to do it today. And if you're not, you're going to get forced to do it soon. PCI is forcing you to do it. Auditors are forcing you to do it. Executive management's forcing you to do it. Someone's forcing you to do this. You know, all these breaches that happen have gotten people nervous. They want you to start doing this kind of scanning. So I'm going to give you an example of Qualys. Qualys is an industry standardized scanner. There's others like Nessus and some others, IP360. And this is a general scanner that you use. You set it up, and it scans your whole network, and it does really nice reporting, and you can do scheduling, and it's great. You can do authenticated scans and unauthenticated scans. It uses public databases to do those scanning, so it has resources, and it pulls from CVE, from MITRE, and all those kind of fun places. And it is completely useless on the mainframe outside of some common issues, right? Why is that? Qualys doesn't support ZOS. Neither does Nessus. Neither do any of the vulnerability scanners because they rely on public disclosure of vulnerabilities to do their scanning. And what do the big mainframe vendors not do? Publicly disclose vulnerabilities. So what is it checking against? It's going to catch small things. It's going to catch things like, oh, you have an SSL cert that's invalid. Oh, you're running a version of Apache that's two versions old. But does that even apply on the mainframe? Is that even a security vulnerability on the environment? Qualys doesn't know. Qualys thinks you're running it in Windows or Linux or Unix or something else. They have no idea what environment that is. So what you end up having is you end up having this, this, this scenario of, OK, so we fixed all the SSL certs and we removed that Apache server. Great. Now our mainframe is secure. Look, we have green reports every quarter. No vulnerabilities. So you're just doing compliance for compliance sake at this point. That's all you're doing. You're appeasing, like I put here, you're appeasing the PCI gods. That's the only person who's like, oh, great, you have, a, you have a clean vulnerability report. I can write that up and be gone. They know, we know, nothing good is coming out of that. Okay, now this part's going to be a little rough to get through. And I'm going to try to try to sugarcoat a little bit. But again, personal opinion, don't, don't kick me out of here. So the community, when I started, the community is kind of rough to break into, especially for a hacker to try to break into. It's really tough. The current model for interaction, I come from a space where everything's open, everything's public. If you want to learn about something, you go watch a video and you go look, read a guide. And then I go, oh, I want to look up some information and read some forum posts about top secret. Oh, I have to pay to get access to the forums and also be using top secret if I want to learn about top secret. OK, that's a challenge. It's also really challenging because of the interactions within the community. It's hard to be a new person in the community. So I'm going to give you an example. This is a post. The content of the post, don't bother reading this tiny print if you can see it from the back. The, the question is not what really matters. It's really a problem with using Sue and they're having a challenge using Sue. Well, for me, the important piece is the answer. This is the answer they got. Take a look at the manual. And if you read the manual, you'll see it says X, Y, and Z. Go ahead and do that in your program, and you should be fine. Notice he literally said, read the manual. Here's your mistake. But he said it in such a way as to not scare the person off so that they never come back. Contrast this with a forum post that I found when I was looking for a problem with JCL. OK? That's a much better reaction than I thought I was going to get. So, and I didn't cherry pick, by the way. I didn't go and, I, I didn't go and specifically find the one guy, and it's like, ah, oh, I got you. No. This is, this is one of multiple examples that I found when searching. Another example is, let's see, I was trying to figure out, I was running RDZNT, and 
I was trying to change the initial screen when you log in the USS tab, and I thought to myself, okay, someone's had to have, have written about how to do that, so I searched. And a person did, someone said, hey, I need to change this, I wanna make it pretty. Okay, great, the first answer, talk to your system programmers. And the person said, I don't have system programmers. He said, then you have no business changing <laughs> that logo. <laughs> and it took, and he's, he's not wrong, but <laughs> it, took him, it took him a full page and a half until he said, no, this is a test system that I own and run. Is there no instructions how to do this? Meanwhile, I was literally this morning looking up how to do something on Google Spreadsheets, and the first answer that the person replied was a detailed answer on how to do something, and it was just an anonymous forum post. So here I highlighted the go away, you've been told what to do. The other challenge, for me at least, is there's a lot of vendor trust in this space. This is an example of an email. So IBM recently released changes to RackF, so they're, they're changing the, the DES hashing algorithm. In 2012, I released a, an upgrade. Well, me and, and Nigel Pentland and Dero Colia, we released upgrades to John the Ripper so it can crack RackF databases to get user passwords. IBM, just recently, and I, I assume I had nothing to do with it, I assume that it, it's in years in the works to do this. So they released an upgrade to change it from DES to AES. So this is an email on the Rackf mailing list where someone said, hey, in the crypto world, you don't trust someone to implement crypto. They say, this is the crypto we're using, come take a look. If Microsoft said, hey, we have a new hashing algorithm, don't worry about it, it's great. Right, I can hear some chuckles already. No one would believe that. But this is someone saying, hey, are we gonna let, you know, are we gonna trust IBM? Can we not just see the algorithm and, and decide for ourselves? And the person just replies, yeah, we are. We're just gonna trust them straight up. And this is not the only reply, I didn't cherry pick again. Another person replied and said, well, if you don't like it, write your own and use the system exits. I was like, well, that's not really constructive. That doesn't really help. And I'm, this is me just being an observer. I'm not replying, I'm too afraid to post in these mailing lists, I gotta be honest. <laughs> now I'm even more afraid now that I've given this talk. Okay, so whew. So, I'm through the, the hard, the rough part for me. Now, we're coming. And we're the good guys. We're not the bad people. I have a good paying job. I work for a large financial institution. I like my job, I wanna keep it. I'm not gonna go and hack into a bank and go to jail. I'm not a Russian mobster, right? So, in 2012, when I started doing this research and I started asking questions, there was nothing. There was no information available. In fact, there was no public discussion. The only public discussion was, don't talk about that, hackers are reading this mailing list. There was no tools. There was no tool support. Metasploit, Nessus, all the kind of hacking tools, no support for ZOS. And there was complete misunderstanding of the tools that did exist. So there was, a, there was a post in 2012 to a mailing list about someone asking about John the Ripper, me, and the person said, it doesn't matter because you can't run John the Ripper on ZOS. And they said, categorically, it doesn't matter, end of discussion. And they fundamentally did not understand. John the Ripper runs on Linux, it cannot run on ZOS, period, and it runs in Linux, and you download the RackF database, and you do offline cracking at home without touching the mainframe. But this person didn't understand that. And I got in trouble for asking those questions. And not with the community. I got in some serious trouble, and you'll see in a bit. So in 2012, I decided I'm gonna give talks, I'm gonna start doing this, I'm gonna start. So I gave my first public talk, and I started posting questions to mailing lists about John the Ripper, and, and then with significant help from Nigel and Diru, we implemented support for cracking RackF databases. I started a mainframe security blog, and I thought, ah, huh, I can sit back and let the community build up. You know, like I've done this, I've exposed, I've pointed out where people can talk, and in 2012, I did not get a single email. I set up a special email account for all this stuff. Not a single email. No one contacted me. I even looked, I looked last week. I went back in 2012, not a single email about this. So I said, all right. I need to continue pushing. So in 2013, in 2014, I gave, in between the two years, I gave 10 talks. I gave eight in the US, I gave one in Sweden, and one in Budapest. My wife at the end of 2013 said, that's enough. You have done too many talks, you're gonna get burned out. 
And I was getting all upset, and I was like, you know what? And she was right. I was totally burned out. I had done too much. Because every talk I try to give something new, I try to talk about something different. I was spending all my time, my free time, working on this instead of spending time with my newborn son. So she says you can only do like three talks a year. So this counts as one. This whole convention counts as one because I'm giving other talks. So <laughs> that's the deal. But I started creating my own tools. I created the man in the middle that you saw earlier. I created a tool that will enumerate user IDs. I also created a tool for escalating privileges in OMVS, and you'll see a demo of that. Uh, that I can't take credit for figuring out. That was figured out by the hackers who broke into a mainframe in Sweden. And I also added support for Netcat on the mainframe. I've also done a couple of other things, like using FTP to submit JCL, which then gives you a shell on a box just through FTP. And then I started seeing interest in the community. I started getting some emails. So I got an email. OK, they got my name wrong, but that's fine, because my name's not really public anyways. And they said, you know, oh, I attended your talk, and it was great. Can you send me the slides? Sure. Hey, I saw your PowerPoint presentation. We like what you were doing. Can you send us some details about how you do that FTP thing? You know, I don't do contract work. I'm gainfully employed. I have nothing to sell. So sure, I'll send you whatever you need. This is a long email to say, I'm an exploit developer. I do exploit development on Windows, Linux, Android. I'm really interested in the mainframe. You're the only person out there publicly talking about it. I would love to do this. Specifically, so I would love to get my shot at laying waste to some mainframes. <laughs> right? And this is not, someone told me that I asked them, like, what's your interest in mainframes? And they said, nothing puts the cold fear of God into a corporation if you can tell them I can hack a mainframe. Because that's where all the goodies are. There's some stuff in Windows, some stuff in Linux, but the mainframe, that's where everything's kept. Now this email, so we'll wait for this, there we go. This email is some, from someone who may be here, I don't know. They work for a small company that does software development. And this one is sort of in, indicative of the, the challenges with the community, is the bottom. It says, needless to say, the mainframe community sucks and I appreciate what you are doing to make it better for us. I don't know who us is in this context. All I'm doing is talking about it. I'm not actively trying to make it better. I'm just talking about security on the platform. And then here's, this is a little snippet from a really long email that talks about, you know, thanks for doing the work and sort of, you know, giving, hey, thanks for your interest and I'm really helpful to help out and all that kind of stuff. Here's my favorite one. This is one of the first ones I got. I got it as an anonymous note to my blog from a two or three letter large corporation in the mainframe space. I'm not going to name names. I censored it out. And I'll read this out to you. You guys can probably see that. But hey, I started working at blank on some mainframe software a few months ago, and it's good to know someone else is worried about the security. I can't really tell you what I work on, but it is remarkable how lax the security is and how habitually it's overlooked. I suppose my main point is to keep fighting the good fight. I didn't even know I was fighting a fight, first of all. But on one side, it's great to get these emails, but on the other side, it kind of breaks my heart because I love the mainframe and the platform, and I shouldn't really be getting people telling me to keep fighting. I'm not fighting you guys. And then there were two of us. Who has seen this talk? No one. Wow. So Dominic White gave a talk at Hack in the Box Amsterdam and DerbyCon. If you click that link, you should be able to see that talk. It's free. It's available. It's an hour long. And basically what he did was he found out that there are vulnerabilities in 3270 on certain applications. And if you can manipulate the way the screen is displayed, you can bypass access restrictions or access features that you shouldn't have had access to. And so he wrote a tool called Big Iron Reconnaissance and Pwned, which stands for burp. And he wrote this tool and released it at the conference. He also made another tool called Mainframe Brute. Now, Mainframe Brute allows you to do things like Kicks transaction ID brute forcing, IMS ID brute forcing, and TSO, well, VTAM application ID brute forcing. So it can do that all through this tool. And he has a whole database of things to look for in those tools that come with them. So if you get a chance, I, please go take a look at this talk. It's really great. Um, it's not as, it's, my talks are not nearly as good as that talk. I'll just say that. So here's an example of one of the tools I wrote. Um, I made it all colorful for, for a talk I gave at a hacker convention. But all it does is it connects, and if, you, if it has access to the TSO panel, the login panel, it'll enumerate all the users on your system. All it does, so the TSO panel right now says, hey, 
are you a valid user or not? And if you put in a valid user, it says, okay, great, please put in your password. And if you put in an invalid user, it says, oh, this person doesn't have access to TSO. So this tool goes and it just says, hey, is Phil a valid TSO user? No, okay. Is Case a valid TSO user? Yes. And it'll also tell you if the user's logged in. So you can actually see if it's a valid account or not. Here's an example of the Set UID Explorer. I'm sorry for the folks in the back. You can see I'm on ZOS. I have an ID. There's a Set UID Linux rec script, a Unix rec script. All it does is say the word yay. You can see I ran it, it said yay. That's all it does. Set UID zero. This script takes a Set UID zero rec script, spawns it, and then using a flaw in the spawn command, gives me a shell with UID zero. Now this has been fixed. This was fixed in 2012. So don't stay here, don't go running. This has all been fixed and patched and it's all been taken care of. But it was possible. Here's a screenshot of Burp. Burp is the tool I was mentioning before. Here's the man in the middle. You saw man in the middle earlier. And here's an example of me combining FTP and that rec script and some C programming into a script that you connect through FTP and it gives me a shell on my Linux box on the mainframe. You can see here it'll connect, it submitted a job, it's waiting, I have root, and if I type ID, you can see I have UID zero, you can see that, and you can see I'm on ZOS. All right, now not all of this I can take credit for developing, some of it was because of this breach. So I'm gonna talk about, briefly I'm gonna talk about the breach and how it went down. In the bottom left-hand corner, is a gentleman by the name of Anakata. Uh, that's not his full name. His full name is, is Gottfried. You can see in the article here. He was arrested in April of 2013 and charged for breaking into a Swedish government mainframe. Why he did that was because in 2012, he was arrested. He was one of the founding members of the Pirate Bay. The Pirate Bay is a prolific pirating software site. Music, videos, games, whatever you want, you can get it there. Him and two other gentlemen ran the site, were prosecuted by the Swedish equivalent of the RIAA. They were charged, they lost their case, he fled to Cambodia. A little while later, Cambodia hackers steal other people's Wi-Fi, steal her credentials, to the online system used to manage court filings and identify people on bail and that sort of information. He then finds out that that web server is running on ZOS. And so he has a huge chip on his shoulder. Not only is he upset against this lawyer because he lost, he's also upset at the government because they agreed with her and let him lose the case. So what does he do? He goes and installs Hercules. Hercules is a ZOS system emulator. It's really fantastic. I implore you to go check it out. If you want a free open source, well, it's not really open source, it's just more of, it's so old that the, the trademarks have expired of, of ZOS, it's more MVS. You can run turnkey MVS, it's public domain. You can go and run it free and clear. It's really interesting, you can play games like Cave or Star Trek or really old stuff. He then obtains an operating system, he obtains ZOS through his pirating ways. He obtains it somehow. Now, I wrote here, it was version one, release nine. I have heard other places, it was version one, release four that he got. Using, whichever, it doesn't matter because that's still old. Using those versions, he then develops two zero days. Now, a zero day is a way to attack a system that has never been released. It's called a zero day because it has been on the market for zero days. That's why it's called a zero day. So. He develops these two zero days. Now these are two of the three only known publicly released vulnerabilities for ZOS that I'm aware of. Please prove me wrong, but these are the only ones that I know of. CVE 2012-5951 is the one I showed you. The one I created is a little more user friendly, a little easier to use, but this is the original script called cuckoo.rx. If you wanna see a copy of that, there's a link at the bottom. All of the files used in the breach that were either sent to me anonymously which did happen, or were part of the investigation paperwork are on that site. 
He then also created a, another script called UTCAM, which took advantage of a flaw in the CGI bin parser. CGI bin parser, if you passed it a semicolon, it would then, if you know anything about Unix, when you pass a semicolon to a command, you're saying, stop executing that command and then execute whatever I put behind it. If you have a CGI bin parser, that means in the URI, I can put a semicolon and then just start typing commands that'll get executed in OMBS. That plus the other issue gives me access to some pretty brutal things. He also installed eight backdoors. They're all C programs, they were all set UID zero, all they did was give him a root shell on the box. One of them, however, he turned into, let's see, CSQXDISP, which is an IBM program that comes with OMVS, but he put it in a different folder. Knowing that if people were looking for his back, his back doors, at least this one was named something that looks like it belongs there. This program would phone home to a third party and he would connect and it would let him do amazing things. It would let him do things like list all the users that are currently logged on. List all the users and their password hashes. Show me, show me this data set. Find a data set that contained this kind of information. He was doing all this through a system that phoned home. He was amazing. I feel terrible that he's in jail because he would be a much better keynote speaker to come and talk about what he did. I'm serious. He also installed backdoor in INET D, INET D. So some of you are thinking, well, who cares? He had, root, he had UID zero. We don't give much access to UID zero or the OMVS kernel ID for anything. Using INET D, all he, all he has to do is say, INET D a port the user and the shell that he wants to run from that user. And now he has access to anything that that user has access to, including things like the RACF database. So he also downloaded the RACF database and cracked it using John the Ripper and cracked more than 100,000 passwords on the system. He had so many accounts that they couldn't keep them out. Every account that they de de denied, he just used a different account. He had cracked so many passwords. He also installed SSH keys. Now what's an interesting property of SSH keys is if you have SSH keys, and you revoke an account in RACF, I can still access OMVS because SSH doesn't ask RACF if the account's valid because it asks for the cert. So it doesn't matter if my account's revoked or not, I have an SSH key, I can just connect straight in. It doesn't even ask me for a password. And it doesn't matter what the status of my account is. And if someone steals those, those private keys, they can have access to that password too. And then he also wrote some custom assembly to disable RACF. Uh, tfy.source.backdoor, you can check it out. Now, remember earlier I said I got in trouble for asking some simple questions on a mailing list. I'm not gonna let you read this whole thing, but essentially, I was under investigation for the breach, initially. Because I was the only person on the planet asking questions about how do you break into a mainframe. How do you crack the RACF database? How do you do this? That's all I was asking. And they weren't on like super secret hacker mailing lists, they were just public mailing lists. And this is an email they sent to Google. And they said, Google, hold this account, give us all the IP addresses, and we're gonna need some emails. Google said, who are you? You're not American, we only see American IP addresses. Here's the phone number for the FBI to call if you really need this information. Yeah. So. I gave a talk in Sweden, met up with the investigations team that did the investigation, and they told me, they said, yeah, we, know, we knew it wasn't you after about a couple of months of investigation, but we didn't, so we didn't get your emails or anything. However, I did not know that. I was reading this, the whole investigation docket, I was reading it in April of 2013. This email went to Gmail April 2012. So I'm sitting there on my couch, and I'm reading, and I go, oh my God, I'm in, under investigation. And I look at the date, oh my God, it's now. It's happening right now. I gotta start deleting everything. And then I looked, oh, like, oh okay, <laughs> it's 2012. They've only been investigating me for a year. <laughs> now, if you want more information about the breach, I told you it was gonna be a high level talk about the breach. If you want more information about the breach, there's a couple of ways to get it. You can read the detailed investigation, although most of it's in Swedish. So if you speak Swedish, great. You can read the very few news articles. I gotta give whoever was managing the PR for this 
They did a great job. There's not many news articles. There's a bunch of news articles in Swedish. That's it. You can buy me a beer. That's a pretty good, good way. Cher has been buying me a lot of beers. So, so instead, I'll just give a talk tomorrow at the same time as this keynote was today in the Aspen room. And I implore you to come. If you're interested in learning more about the breach, I'll have demos of all the attacks he used, how he used them, way more details about the case than I was able to give here given the short timeline. So if you're interested, please come out and see that. So what can we do? We've learned about sort of my background. We learned about the current state, how hard it is to break into this industry. We also learned that you know, there are vulnerabilities on the platform that hackers can take advantage of. So what can we do? I hope that me being up here has taught some of, some of the people here that hacker is not a bad word. It's used as a bad word in the press because it's easy and cheap. Being a hacker is not a bad word. The DEF CON convention has 14,000 attendees last year, and it's growing every year. All 14,000 people can't be evil hackers. Most of them are like you and I. They just work for a large corporation. Their job is to defend the systems. And what better way to defend the systems than attacking them like an attacker would attack them? That's the only way you know that your defenses are strong enough. The military has something called tiger teams. And a tiger team is designed to attack a military base the same way an attacker would attack the military base so that they can find the weaknesses that the military base wasn't following procedures and all that kind of stuff. So we're not all bad. Or maybe you still think I'm terrible because of what I've been saying. That's fine. There's definitely demand now in the hacker community. There didn't used to be any demand. Now there's an appetite. Now, there's, now because of me, there's somewhere to go to get resources and information. There's other people who are talking about hacking mainframes. There's other guides online now. People are interested, and so they're coming. And you can either work with us, or you can work against us. Because like it or not, Information security is not going anywhere. The penetration testing team, once they've settled down and all the Linux and Windows boxes are locked down as comfortable as they feel, they're moving off to the mainframe platforms. And not just ZOS, they're probably going to target Unisys and Tandems as well, but it's coming. There was a great article written about my talk at Black Hat, and the, the article was, yeah, you have a mainframe, but who cares? And his whole point was, Listen, you, got, you have way more important things to worry about than your mainframe. Your mainframe is probably OK. And I wrote a response saying, you know what? He's absolutely right. If you're still dealing with simple malware on your Windows workstations, and your information security department is, is not mature enough to manage common enterprise issues on like patching and so on and so forth, you have no business talking to the mainframe, because you've got easier things to, to knock off your list. But when that's done, and some corporations are done doing that, they have very mature information security programs, they're going to start taking a look at how they can crack the mainframe open, how they can put it through its paces security-wise, and start implementing the processes that exist for the open systems on your mainframe. And it's going to come whether you like it or not. It's going to come through the audit mandate. I used to be an auditor, so boo hiss. But it's going to come from someone on the audit team saying, hey, you do quarterly scans on your Windows boxes, why does the mainframe get a pass? Oh, well, it's, it's secure. Well, how do you know that you didn't do any scans on it? Now, mind you, my argument against the scans being worthless notwithstanding, that's what an auditor is going to think. It might come from executive mandate. An executive might say, hey, uh, Target was breached, Sony was breached, Chase was breached, Home Depot was breached. What are we, I mean, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield was breached. What's our security program look like? Where are our gaps? And they're going to come back, and they're going to say, we're doing all this work in this open system space, but we haven't had the time to tackle the mainframe space yet. And to be honest, it's probably going to come from someone like me who works on the red team, someone who, who says, why can't I do a penetration test on the mainframe? And the red team doesn't have to ask for permission to do a test. Sure, they may be respectful and say, hey, I'm going to do a test at midnight so I'm not impacting daily production. But they're going to go, and they're going to go do it. So either way, it's coming. So in my opinion, it's better to be at the table and come forward and start embracing 
the hacker community, start embracing the culture. They're just curious kids. They're just people who are curious about doing stuff. Sure, some of them, we have a term for them called script kiddies. Their whole, their whole thing is to go and, oh, they want to steal credit card data like the Russian mobsters, or they want to go and they want to, you know, break out their phone so they can make phone calls outside of their time limits or stupid things like that. But the real people who are doing the, the real interesting things, they're all working in the corporate space and doing it because they love it, not because they're trying to break into your mainframe and steal all your money. That's not the reality anymore. Sure, the, the guy who did the mainframe breach tried to steal some money, but that's because he had a giant chip on his shoulder. Now, this slide, when you see it, this is where I'd like to see in the future. Now, I know the, I'll get to the last bullet, don't worry. That's gonna be a real downer. But the first thing is capture the flag. Now, a capture the flag event, that's where you take a system and you make it secure, but not fully secure. You leave some holes open on purpose. And then you make some of the holes small and you make some of the holes really big. And then for each person that attacks, they're able to break in using some of those holes and they get points. They get a flag, which is worth 100 points, 200 points, 300 points. And I would love to see vendors and ZOS get into that space of doing that kind of testing. And the reason is it's beneficial for both sides. One, some of you are already thinking, oh my god, if you do that, you're just training hackers to hack mainframes. They're, the ones that want to learn it, they'll go do it themselves. They're not going to wait for a capture the flag event. This also gives them a creative outlet to flex their skills on the platform. If they want to learn about hacking the platform and they don't have anywhere to go, where do you think they're going to go? They're not going to go back to Windows. They've got the bug. So they're going to go after other people's mainframes. Another good thing about Capture the Flag is if you're running it, you can capture all the information of all the attacks that people tried and failed on your platform. So now you have all this analytics of stuff that didn't work, that you can prove, that you can now keep in your marketing material, and you have evidence of stuff that did work, that maybe someone didn't attack in a manner that you didn't really expect. Maybe they did an attack, you set it up so that they were gonna try to guess a password, and they went a total roundabout way to get it that you had no idea existed. There's another contest at CanSec West called Pwn to Own. Uh, Pwn to Own, silly name notwithstanding, is a contest where the people, the vendors, and like, a good example would be Google. Google brings their Chrome browser every year. And if you, can, if you can breach it, if you can prove their security vulnerabilities that were hackable and that you were able to do an exploit, you get a laptop. You're paying, and the conference costs two, north of $2,000 to attend. So it's not like it's all these kids that are attending. It's professionals who just want a challenge. They just want to do something fun with their skills. And for 2,000 bucks, Google has the world's best hackers trying to break into their product. You can't get that. If you get a consulting firm to come in, you might get some of the world's best hackers, but it ain't going to cost you two grand. Or I mean, Google gives, Google gives their Chrome tops, which is like $400 laptop, and they get the world's best hacker to come and break into their machines. And again, you get all the analytics. If you put your system out there, and if you put your application out there to be breached, you get all the analytics of all the attempts that successfully worked or failed. There are vendors who go specifically to prove that their system is unhackable because they had the world's best try to break into it, and they'll offer a $10,000 prize if you can do it. And so there's a lot of motivation by some people to try to break into that system because that's real money. And sometimes some vendors have gone and had their systems broken into, and that's fine because they come back the next year with those holes fixed. And they show, again, not only are we unhackable this year, but we listen to the community and we fix the problems. Uh, CCDC, which stands for the Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition. Anyone here heard of that? No. So this contest is used to train the future system administrators for enterprise. It is a contest put on by the schools at the local, then the state, then, inter then the national level. And they set up these systems to look like an enterprise. You have a website, you have an e-tailer site, you have back-end processing, databases, billing, all that stuff. 
and they sit these kids down, and then they get a team, they get a red team, a team of hackers who volunteer their time, and those hackers are told to come in and wreak havoc on the systems. The teams are awarded points at the beginning, and for every minute of downtime, they start to lose points. For every piece of information that's stolen from their enterprise system, they lose points. They're also scored on management interaction. They have fake managers from real corporations in the area come and sit with the team and say, hey, our marketing site was down for two hours yesterday, and our retail site was down for three hours and we lost a million dollars in business. What's going on? How come you didn't send me an email? I need a report by tomorrow. I need a report in the next hour on everything that's going on in this breach. And so it's training the kids how to really respond in an enterprise space when a real attack happens. And I would love to see, because the, re the reality is, all the enterprises, all the big, important enterprises are using mainframes for processing. It would be amazing to have them just give them some, you know, emulated systems, throw your product on it, and say, here, you guys have to manage this as well. And it's, again, same thing, you get all the analytics with it, you get all of the pieces that come together with doing the attacks, and you get to take that to the bank and do your own reviews on it and see what attacks worked and what failed. Now finally, and I know this is, this is a great way to end this keynote, it's a real downer of a, of a topic, but everyone I've talked to at conventions, online, in chat, everywhere, it's in our community, it is still unbelievable that vulnerabilities are kept secret. And the reason why is because we have seen multiple companies go through the same sort of curve. And they start a product and they keep everything secret. For example, Cisco. Cisco is probably the best example. Cisco is unhackable, so they said. Then talks started happening at DEF CON about how to breach Cisco systems. And Cisco sued DEF CON. Said, you can't have these talks go on. And the person went up on stage and gave the talk anyways and got fired. And eventually, just through people breaking into the system and publicly talking about the breaches that they did, publicly talking about the exploits that they knew, Cisco finally started publicizing the known vulnerabilities that they know of. And they put it in CVEs. Same thing with Microsoft. You can, I can guarantee you Microsoft did not want to publish CVEs when they started making Windows, especially when they started making Windows NT. They probably didn't want anyone to know about security vulnerabilities on the platform, especially not because they were going up against the mainframe. But they're doing it now. Linux, Linux doesn't have a choice because it's open source. There's hundreds of vendors who publicize all their vulnerabilities. And the reason is the more people you have looking at something, the more secure it's going to be. The more people who are actively trying to break into the system in their spare time at home, they're not breaking into your bank, the more secure it's going to be for you and for the world. And the reason I say that is because all of my money is on mainframes. Just like most of you, I have stock in a company run by mainframes. My paycheck is processed by a company that uses ZOS. The financial institution I work for that pays my paycheck, they use a lot of mainframes too. So if this platform really went down in flames, which I doubt it would, it would be some significant global impact to not only the systems itself, but to the brand as well. So on that cheery note, I'd like to say thank you. I was going to try to leave time for questions, but it uh, doesn't look like I'll have time. I'm giving a panel tomorrow. If you want to come with a bunch of other experts, please come. It'll be great. I want to thank everyone for coming to see the talk. I want to thank Cher for inviting me to give the keynote. Um, it was a nerve-wracking experience, so thank you. Yeah. Um, I will really want to thank the Swedish underground hackers for legitimizing my work. It really makes giving a talk like this easier, because then I can say, see, see? And I want to thank Nigel Pentland, dear Chloe. When I started out, and I was getting really just blocked at every avenue, I couldn't get any headway, they really helped sort of build up my confidence to say, no, you can do this, and here's how you do that, and, and that sort of thing. So, so thank you very much, and thanks for those who are watching online. Thank you.